It lit up the nights in Harlem until morning, and each evening boasted the finest drinks and wildest entertainment money could buy. It was the place to see and be seen, all for a $3 cover. But its doors weren't open to everybody. Case number 18, The Cotton Club, today on The Noir Factory. Noir, suspense, true crime, hard-boiled fiction. Explore the dark alleys and cheap gin joints of mob history, noir films, hard-boiled paperbacks, and two-fisted pulp fiction with mystery writer and make-believe detective Stephen Gomez. Grab your fedora and button your lip as you enter the office of the internet's finest fictional detective agency, The Noir Factory. It was infamously racially exclusive. W.C. Handy wished to go in one evening to the Cotton Club, and he was turned away, and he could hear his music being performed. Levering Lewis, historian. It was the greatest nightclub of its day, and there's a convincing argument to be made that it was the greatest nightclub that ever was. Opening its door during the Harlem Renaissance, the Cotton Club was part speakeasy, part dance hall, part supper club, and all entertainment. Owned by Chicago gangster Oni Madden, the Cotton Club featured expensive food, cold beer, even during Prohibition, and the greatest lineup of black entertainers in America of its time, and perhaps of any time. And it was all available for a small cover charge, but only if you were white. We can talk about the spectacle and the grandeur that was a Cotton Club literally for hours. It was the greatest show place of its day. If a song or a band were hit there, they were a hit in America. If a dancer killed on stage, then they made a career for themselves. It was the venue of its day, and one of the few available for black entertainers, but it was also a huge symbol of segregation. And if we're really going to talk about the Cotton Club, then we have to go over the menu before the music starts. The aperitif for the evening has to be the black renaissance of Harlem. In early 1900, real estate was a booming business in urban cities throughout America. Construction was at an all-time high, and places like Harlem were transformed from shanties and lean-tos into townhomes and brownstones, geared towards lower upper-class couples who were getting their start and were on their way up. But the early 1900s was a real estate bubble, and like all bubbles, it had to burst. When it did, the developers in Harlem found themselves with great apartments and townhouses, with no upper-class or even middle-class willing to rent them. Faced with bankruptcy, the developers of the neighborhood marketed the building to black families in New York, giving them an opportunity to own or rent buildings in a market they'd never been able to participate in before. At a highly inflated rate, of course. We can't really paint the developers of Harlem with too sparkly a paintbrush on this one. Despite the cost, however, black families with higher incomes came to Harlem to make it theirs. Families and individuals who were removed from slavery by more than a generation. Affluent, moneyed families who could afford the higher rent demands by Harlem. In some cases, the rents were so high that while predominant blacks who'd made money in sports and entertainment field could afford the astronomical rent, other families had to share apartments or take in boarders. Still, it was a black neighborhood in New York that was growing in leaps and bounds, and it was home to a movement that brought many blacks throughout the South to Harlem in a very bohemian way. Art, music, poetry, philosophy, and fashion flourished there, and what was referred to as the New Negro Movement took root, shaping what art and literature looked like in America for decades to come. And if that Harlem Renaissance is truly the apportif, then the first course has to be the heavyweight champion of the world. Jack Johnson was born in Galveston, Texas, to two former slaves in 1878. He left school around the age of 12 and he worked countless menial jobs before he found his calling in the squared circle. Known as the Galveston Giant, Johnson dominated his opponents in the ring. He was a fast, clever fighter who understood strategy as well as patience. He worked his way right up the ladder until he eventually captured the title of World Colored Heavyweight Champion, which at the time was the pinnacle for any black fighter in the U.S. But Jack Johnson wasn't just any black fighter in the U.S., 
and he wasn't going to be satisfied with being the world color heavyweight champ. No one with his ability would be. He had his eye on big prize. We could fill up many podcasts with the exploits of Jack Johnson, and maybe we will. But for now, we'll work the heavy bag with the highlights and go from there. And we'll start with the circumstances of his lifetime. In the 1900s, black boxers took the ring with regularity against their white counterparts. And they did well, but they were not allowed to fight for the title. Especially for the heavyweight title. But then, Jack Johnson always fought with strategy and patience. For two years, Johnson followed Tommy Burns, the reigning heavyweight champ, around the world, taunting him at a shot for the belt. Burns finally gave Johnson the chance in Sydney, Australia, the day after Christmas in 1908. In a brilliant display, covered by novelist Jack London, Johnson outlasted the reigning champ. He had trained and waited his entire life for his moment, and with trademark confidence and strength, Johnson made the most of it. The fight was stopped in the 14th round, and Johnson was awarded the title of Heavyweight Champ of the World, making him simultaneously the most hated and the most beloved American for over a decade. And Jack Johnson probably wouldn't have had it any other way. Johnson was a hard man, but he wasn't a brutal man. He loved women, drinks, good food, and a great time. He loved music, and he loved to celebrate. And there was not a fair fight in the world that Jack Johnson, the Galveston giant, would have ever walked away from. But not all fights, unfortunately, are fair. And finally, as we finish up the first course and the band takes its place, we get to the bread of the meal. And the bread is Oni Madden. Born in Leeds, Oni Madden came to America as a child. His family settled in Hell's Kitchen, where Madden fell in with Irish and English gangs. The streets were a second home for Madden, and he flourished there, earning his nickname The Killer before he even turned 18. By age 21, he led a powerful coalition of gangs in New York, and was eating away at turfs of rival gangs. One of those gangs, the Dusters, tried to hit Madden outside of a dance hall on November 6, 1912. Over 11 bullets found Madden that day, but none of them did their intended work. He lay in intensive care and in great pain, but he refused to tell the police who had tried to rub him out. It just wasn't the gang way. Months later, after Madden recovered, the suspects from the rival gang began to disappear, or they were just found dead. Madden continued to control his gang with a ruthless zeal, and in 1914, when a member of his gang, little Patsy Doyle, betrayed him to the cops over a woman, that zeal cost Madden. Madden had Doyle killed, but the killers were in turn picked up by the police. Implicating Madden, the cops arrested the gang leader. He was tried and sentenced to 20 years in Sing Sing, which would have most men devastated. For Oni Madden, this was old home week. In Sing Sing, he caught up with old friends from the Five Points gang, such as Joe Vellacci and Jimmy the Civ de Stefano. Prisoners would seek him out for advice, and Madden, in return, was hungry for stories of New York. Madden ran his gang from prison, working with other criminals who enforced his will on the outside. He saw the opportunity for great profits in bootlegging during the Prohibition, and acted on him, and by the time he was paroled in 1923, he had a number of operations going. But only Madden was always a man looking for more. And now as the lights go down over our full table and fresh drinks, the band leader takes his stand and far off notes of a trumpet cut through the smoke filled air. It is the promise of mystery and intrigue, of imagination and expectation that move us forward. It is angelic voices combining with demonic horns to fill the air with music sweeter than the ambrosia of the gods themselves, and all of it pulls us in. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the cotton glove right after this message. Hi, Steve Gomez here. We've been sending out ciphers from the Noir Factory offices, telling you what's new and good from the world of Noir, hard-boiled true crime, and mystery fiction. In the dark, trash-filled city alleyways, in the cheapest gin-soaked back rooms of waterfront dives, in the lowest, filthiest, God-forsakenest hideouts and safe houses in existence, we've been there. We've gone to the worst places imaginable to forge contracts with the worst people imaginable. We've committed unspeakable acts to grow our underground empire. 
all in order to get you the skinny and the best in crime, corruption, mayhem, and we vow to continue. What's that? You've been at Starbucks. Oh, well that explains it. In that case, head over to thenoirfactory.com and sign up for our newsletter. There you'll find the scoop on what's happening at the factory, as well as the world of hard-boiled noir in general. And while you're at it, pop over to Facebook and Instagram and drop us a line, letting us know what you want to hear from the podcast, as well as anything else you might want us to know. We're curious in that way. So enjoy your coffee, but take a moment to consider French press next time. It takes a little longer, but I think you'll find it's well worth the wait. And now, back to this week's crime, already in progress. As the Renaissance continued, the brightest and the most talented in the black community flocked to Harlem. Soon the creativity and talent of Harlem eclipsed anywhere in the city, including Broadway. What they needed was a venue, a showplace where artists could work their craft for audiences who appreciated it, particularly one with a big name and money behind it. While Jack Johnson may not have possessed a keen business mind or remotely considered himself a patron of the arts, he was a man who again loved a really good time. In 1920, Johnson opened the Club Deluxe at the corner of 142nd and Lenox Avenue in Harlem. The Club Deluxe was a nightclub serving supper and sold illegal beer and booze. But more than that, it was a place for local talent, the best talent in the world, to work a stage and take a small audience from downtown New York clear into another world. Not much is known about the day-to-day -day workings of the Club Deluxe. It's impossible to say that over time, it might have become the legend that the Cotton Club was, but it never really had a chance. Opinions are still split whether the club was a success or failure, but as the club operated over the next couple years, others saw potential in this new Harlem Renaissance as well. The neighborhood had an aura of electricity about it. Rent parties, in order to pay the outlandishly high prices of the apartments, were common. Jazz was also common. Music floated through speakeasies, parties, working-class bars, as did tobacco smoke and marijuana. Gay clubs such as the Clam House dotted the area of 133rd Street, also known as Jungle Alley. In the media, both Greenwich and Harlem were considered wild and exotic. Vanity Fair called the area popular for revelers, but not for the innocent. A New York newspaper also described Harlem in the 20s as a seething cauldron of Nubian mirth and hilarity. For everyone in Harlem, there was something to see and something to experience, and Jack Johnson wasn't the only one to see potential there. Where there was bootleg booze, there were bootleggers. And that meant the mob. There wasn't just a demand for alcohol in Harlem. There was also the spectacle of Harlem that brought affluent whites in. And all of that meant more profit. With the blessings of the mob, Oni Madden began to sell his Madden number no. one beer in Harlem which was considered to be the best beer in New York. I have no idea who would have ever disagreed with him. In no time at all, Madden's beer was flooding into New York, but he thought there was more profit in running the outlets himself. One of the first places he had in mind was on 142nd in Lenox. As we said, Jack Johnson was a man who loved a fair fight, and if there was one thing that only Madden hated, it was fighting fair. The official story was that the Club Deluxe was having money problems, and out of the goodness of his heart, Oni Madden came in and assumed the debts of the place, as well as paid Jack Johnson a little something for his trouble. In reality, we have no way of knowing how the Club Deluxe was doing, but it's hard to imagine that Johnson was interested in selling his club, the club he took pride in owning, to anyone, let alone someone like Oni Madden. But as we said, Madden didn't fight fair. At the very least, Madden controlled the alcohol supply to the club, and that would have crippled the club and drowned Johnson in debt. And that was the best case scenario. The worst case scenario was, well, Madden was connected with Dutch Schultz mob, and he wanted the club, and his nickname was the killer for a reason. So in a fight he couldn't win, with the crowds absent, and with absolutely no one in the world in his corner, Jack Johnson, the reigning heavyweight champion of the world, did the only thing that was left. He sold the club deluxe to the mobster Oni Madden for a pittance, accepted a tuxedo from the criminal, and showed up every day to the club to greet customers with a handshake and a smile as the assistant manager of the club he once proudly owned. 
Madden and his partner, George Big Frenchy Demange, closed the doors to the Club Deluxe and set about remaking the whole thing. The two hired Herman Stark to be the stage manager and frontman to the club. Stark was legit and actually knew the business, but he also understood who really made the decisions. They also completely redid the interior of the club, with the richest draperies, tablecloths, carpets, and fixtures available. They spared no expense on making the club the most lavish and exquisite supper club they could imagine. The menu of the club was all over the map. They served steaks and chops, prime rib and roast pork, but the best chefs in New York also did their best to serve exotic dishes that matched the exotic entertainment. They reworked Mexican and Asian dishes, and they offered a club version of chop suey and tacos. They also offered spare ribs and fried chicken, at the time thought of as Harlem dishes. The decor of the club was another matter. They dressed the set and house areas of the club in a jungle motif. Dimanche placed artificial potted palm trees liberally around the club to further the illusion. Dimanche also stipulated that all waiters, busboys, cooks, bartenders, service personnel, and performers had to be black. There were different rules for dancers. They had to be black, but lighter skin was preferred, and they had to be at least 5 foot 6 and no older than 21 years of age. It was Madden and Dimanche's idea to market the club to the wealthy, high society whites in New York. They were what Madden referred to as the caviar and martini crowd. The affluent whites would come to Harlem, and they would see the spectacle that would fill the newspapers and magazines of the time, all from the safety of their seats. It was Madden and Dimage's promise that while all the performers and staff were black, under no circumstances were any blacks allowed in as customers of the club. Or, as performer Jimmy Dranny once famously said, it isn't necessary to mix with colored people if you don't like it. You have your own party, and keep to yourself, but it's worth seeing how they step in. And with that, we take a moment to remind our listeners that while it's impossible to view history through a contemporary lens, this one's a little different. The club was segregated at a time and a place it didn't have to be. It did need to exclude anyone as a customer, particularly in Harlem. But the Cotton Club featured that exclusion as their main benefit. And through today's lens, we might like it if such a place that practiced policies like this didn't do well. And that's where that lens cracks. The club was owned by bad men, and we expect bad men to do bad things. But every night, the club also filled to its 700-seat capacity. And on Sundays, celebrity nights, the place was filled with big names. Madden wanted the finest acts of the day, so he hired the most skilled black performers. But he also wanted to appeal to the wealthy white clientele. So we hired the most popular white songwriters of the day to compose scores for his authentic black entertainment reviews. Names like Irving Berlin, Dorothy Fields, and Jimmy McHugh wrote songs and designed shows there. The club officially opened in 1923 as the Cotton Club, with Fletcher Henderson leading the first house band there. Right from the start, the Cotton Club made a splash, and the wealthy of New York lined up. Radio stations began to do live broadcasts from the Cotton Club, which was still an illegal speakeasy selling booze to its patrons in New York. Anderson became the best known band leader of his day. The music of the Cotton Club became the soundtrack of America, and the club made money from its first day. The doors opened at 9 in the evening every night and advertised their chorus girls as tall, tan, and terrific. Music kicked off the evening with the finest dancing and dining in New York. The evening ended with an elaborate song and dance review, and the club closed for the night at 3 a.m. And from the stage, such great tunes made their way into the American songbook, such as I Can't Give You Anything But Love, Stormy Weather, Between the Devil and the Deep Blue Sea, and Hoagie McCarmichael's Stardust. As the fortunes of the club grew, so did Madden's. He brought other clubs in New York, either as a silent partner or a sole owner. By 1930, Madden owned dozens of clubs in New York that served as Madden number one beer, including the exclusive Stork Club. While Madden had almost complete control over the clubs and the beer trade in Harlem, his reign was not without issues. In 1927, the club was shut down briefly when a federal agent brought Madden up on charges of violating the Volstead Act. While the local cops were paid for, it seemed that the federal boys didn't all get the message. A month later, the club reopened 
and while their band leader, Fletcher Henderson, had gone on to greener pastures, they found someone who would become synonymous with the musical talent of the Cotton Club. They brought in Duke Ellington. Duke Ellington, or Sir Duke if you will, was a musical genius who thrived under pressure and wrote incredible music at a moment's notice. He was brought to the Cotton Club by Jimmy McHugh, who had worked with Ellington before and was familiar with his genius. An offer was made, and Madden found out that Ellington was obliged to work in Philadelphia, where he had a long-running engagement. Madden sent some men down to reason with the Philadelphia promoter, and just like that, Duke Ellington took over the bandstand at the Cotton Club. Ellington was originally charged with creating jungle music for the wealthy white patrons. Instead, he brought his best talents to the club, and he staged shows for legendary singers like Lena Horn and Ethel Waters, and for dancers like Bill Bojangles Robinson, Josephine Baker, and the high-flying circus-like Nicholas Brothers. Ellington wrote music that was a hit with anyone with ears, and in an only Madden rarity, he let Ellington do what he did best. Another challenge to Madden's reign in Harlem was Vincent Mad Dog Cole. Cole kidnapped Big Frenchie Dimage and ransomed him to Madden for $35,000. Madden paid, and he got Dimage back, but Cole wasn't done. He then called Madden, and he demanded $100,000, or he would kidnap Madden. Madden already had a $50,000 bounty on Cole's head, but he told Cole he would consider it. On March 8, 1932, Madden called Cole and arranged for a meeting. Cole, again whose nickname was Mad Dog, and not the professor, discussed the meeting from a phone booth in the new London pharmacy, ignoring the man outside the booth in the trench coat. The man in the trench coat put 15 rounds into Cole as he spoke with Madden. And just like that, Madden's problems were gone, at least for the moment. At the Cotton Club, Duke Ellington left in 1930 to go work in Hollywood initially making Amos and Andy movies, but staying on to become a household name. After a few recommendations, four men in wide fedoras arrived at another New York nightclub to meet the band leader there. They told him it would be in his best interest if he was at the Cotton Club the next day for rehearsal. And that's the story of how the Cotton Club got its third band leader, Cab Calloway. Calloway was the opposite of Duke Ellington. While Duke was suave, sophisticated, and well-prepared, Calloway was wild, chaotic, and he flew from the seat of his pants. In a top hat and tails, Calloway's unruly mane of straight black hair flew everywhere, and he bounded around the stage like a man possessed. He had connections and presence, and he drew many of the best musicians of the day to the club to join him. On stage, he was electric, and he commanded the audience's attention. He would yell at the audience and they would yell back. He would smile and they would beam. He was the ultimate entertainer. He was Mr. Idaho. In 1933, Prohibition had come to a close and Madden began to see the writing on the wall for the Cotton Club. He walked away from the business and he opened a spa in Hot Springs, Arkansas, which was popular hideout for mobsters. Big Frenchie Dimash took over the reins of the club and ran it very profitably until a race riot broke out in Harlem, keeping many of his wealthy white patrons from visiting the area. Dimage reopened the Cotton Club at Broadway and 42nd, and he paid Bill Bojangles Robinson the unheard of amount of 3500 a week to help the club maintain its star appeal. However, due to a number of circumstances, such as the Depression, changing musical tastes, the IRS, and Father Time, the Cotton Club was forced to close its doors on June 10, 1940. Jack Johnson, heavyweight champion of the world, died in a car crash on June 10, 1946 near Raleigh, North Carolina, after speeding away in anger from a restaurant that refused to serve him. George Big Frenchie Dimage died not long after the Cotton Club closed. Only Madden lived in Hot Springs until his death from emphysema in 1965. But the Cotton Club lives on in American culture, and its impact on music, history, and art can be seen all over the world, even today. That closes the books on this case. Join us next time on the wrong side of the tracks at the Noir Factory, 
as we look at the best in true crime, noir, and hard-boiled stories has to offer. If you've enjoyed this podcast, then please subscribe on iTunes and leave an honest review. And be sure to stop by the website to fill up on pulpy and hard-boiled goodness. And remember, nice guys finish last. Still there? This week's special Noir Factory Dakota message is coming right up. Crack the code by visiting the noirfactory.com backslash key. 10, 4, 12, 3, 10, 5. That is all. For the key to this code, go to noirfactory.com forward slash key. Good night.